Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining tonight's clinical webcast, the new crystal tear report for the Keratograph 5M. Before we get started, I'd like to point out that you have a text box on the right side of your screen for asking questions, and I encourage you to ask questions during the presentation or even shortly after the presentation, and we'll conclude tonight's session with a Q&A. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Crystal Breimer. Dr. Breimer specializes in managing dry eye and lectures across the country on the subject of ocular surface disease. Dr. Breimer also worked with the Oculus Research and Development team to create the Crystal Tear Report, and thanks to Dr. Breimer's insights, we have a very useful tool for the practitioner. So without further delay, I would like to introduce Dr. Crystal Breimer. Thank you, Chris. So I, I practice in Wilmington, North Carolina, and dry eye is about 90% of what I do there. Um, that was not necessarily by choice, but I'll tell you a little bit more about how that came to be as we go along. About two and a half years ago, John Shackett and I were approached to, to do the vision source dry eye protocol, and this was a big challenge. And we started doing a lot of in-office investigations as to what treatments worked the best and, and what's the best way to really tackle dry eye. And we realized that it is way more than just dry eye. It's ocular surface disease and all the contributors that, that, that go into that. So to really win this battle, we needed to obtain a consistent results and we needed a consistent formula to diagnose these underlying contributors to the to the ocular surface disease. So that's what we what we did and I, and I tell patients as soon as I walk in the door today we're going to do something different. Everybody knows you've had dry eye, but today we're going to find out why. Is there enough water, oil, allergy, inflammation, bacteria, lid function issues, something systemic, something environmental. We're going to find out what's there, and whatever is there, we're going to pair it with a treatment that I know will work. And so this was a great plan, but we had to figure out a way to do it more quickly um, because it was it was just too cumbersome, took too long. So this is, this is where I, I approached Oculus about a year and a half ago and said, you guys have amazing technology to tell the story to the patient so they can really understand what's going on, but, but we need a streamlined version so we can do it quickly. And it, it resulted in the most meaningful project that I've been a part of, um, primarily because I believe this software will allow doctors in really busy practices to address dry eye in a, in a real way in a meaningful way that they wouldn't have had time to do otherwise. Uh, I would unapologetically say that the 5M is the cornerstone of my dry eye practice, and, and here's why. Um, within that first year, I, like I said, dry eye took over my practice. It's about 90% of what I do, and within one year, I had 29 referring doctors. So why is this? Why did they send them to me? Because the outcomes were amazing. And why were they amazing? It wasn't because I was doing something magical. It was because of my, my compliance of my patients. And the reason they were compliant was because of the caliber of the, the patient education I was able to give them with the 5M. And that's what I hope you'll see tonight. I'm going to go through four um, main sessions. We're going to do a capture session showing you every test that can be done and it, as it relates to, to dry eye. And then you can see, all right, what's available? Now, what do I want to weed out and do in my practice? And then we'll go through the patient education piece that I usually go over with my patients. We'll go through the assessment process and how to create that crystal tear report. And then I'll show you how to customize it to be whatever you want it to be in your practice. So this first session, we're going to go to the exam, we're going to go down to load, and you're going to choose your report. So in this one, we're going to choose the full, and you'll see on the right side, this is my work list. This is everything that, we're, that my technician is supposed to acquire. And as you see here, she's got directions on exactly how to do it and an example of what it should look like. You'll also notice that as soon as it captures, it automatically, as soon as she hits that button, it goes to the next one. And it's very smart. It goes left eye to left, then right, 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 gets to the bottom, goes left, left, left. So all of this was designed so that it would be quick. So that it would take fewer seconds, fewer seconds, fewer clicks. The first test you saw was a tear meniscus height. The next is the tear breakup time. And this is a beautiful piece that you can do patient education with, helping them understand that as those rings get blurry and distorted as the tears break up, that's the same thing that's happening to their vision when they look out. And that's why they're having to blink a lot to clear their vision and to, to, to see better. 
So you tell the patient, blink twice. It helps you where to focus. It's not going to start the test until you're dead on focused. Tells them to tell the patient to blink twice and then hold it open as long as they can. And this is my technician, Sarah, and she's got quite a long breakup time. <laughs> this is the longest test of the entire capture sequence. The rest are very much just click, click, click. So at this point, I'm taking a picture of the amount of debris in the tear film. And you'll notice that the capture sequence is not, does not go in the same order as your patient education sequence would. This is going in an order that saves time. So we were already focused on the tear film with the debris, so now we go into interferometry. Take a picture of that color in the tear film, that little bit of oil that she has, and then I'm gonna take a video right after that. Now the way I take a picture versus a video, hold the pedal down and it videos, versus a quick tap and it takes a picture goes right into topography. I do topography on everyone. I only bill it when there's a, a corneal dystrophy and it's billable. That redness scan that you just saw, there is a, um, a gauge where there's an actual number that'll go with that. And then we're just doing a good close-up high mag picture. Then we do a close-up of the lid margin so we can see those meibomian glands. Do the same thing on the top. And the goal here is to focus not just on the lid margin with the glands, but also the lashes. There's an example here and it tells the technician exactly what to do so that they get the results that you're looking for. Once we've gone all the way through this sequence, this is the spot where we would put dye in. So now we go back and start with the left eye and do the same thing. But because it's streamlined like that, it saved a lot of time versus going right eye, left eye, right eye, left eye. You'll find there's a lot of things in here that were just well thought out to try to do that, to save seconds. You can see that little bit of oil in her tear film. And then we get the topography and then move on to the front, to the uh, surface pictures. Now, when, let's say that the technician is doing lash pictures, so not this one, but the next one that's coming, and she notices there's a lot of bacteria in the lashes. She can come down, let me find my mouse. Here we go. She can come down here and unclick this auto button, and then she can stay within that category. At that point, it wouldn't proceed to the next one, and she could take multiple lash pictures if she wanted, or if there was corneal staining or whatever the situation is. So at this point, I stop the video, and I'm about to put the lysamine green in. Now, before I do, I want to go back through every one of these pictures and make sure they're good quality, because if I need to retake any of them, I want to retake them before I put any drops in, because at this point, the patient's had zero drops um, the whole day if, if they did it right and didn't use drops before they came in. So all the pictures are, they look good, they're the right focus, and now that technician's allowed to move on, put the dye in, and proceed with the rest of the work, the work list. So we stop, we put the dye in, we start back. Now you're gonna find in some patients, I put a ton of dye in this young lady and she just, she didn't absorb any. There was no staining, but also it was just very hard to get it to show up on her lid margin. But we're doing nasal conge, temporal conge to show if there's any conjunctival staining. She just has none. And then we're gonna show that lower lid margin to see if there's a line of marks. Now. Again, I put it over and over, and occasionally that's going to happen, but you want at least a thin line of green right here. And it, there's instructions to the technician. If there's not at least a very thin line of green on that margin, you need an additional dye. For the sake of time, I wanted to kind of move on so that I could show you. Same thing. Not any staining, so there's not a lot to see on her, but we get all the quadrants so that if there is staining and it's in a pattern, because you might have exposure pattern staining, you might have it just more nasally um, because the tear drainage in that area and allergies, we want to see that pattern. Tiny little line of green here, not much to see, not like this example. 
just because she has a healthier lid. I've got a 22-year-old <laughs> technician, not, not anybody with uh, significant dry eye disease. And then I pause it for a second, put fluorescein in, and come right back to you. So at this point, one thing that I always want to take in every patient is a picture of that inferior palpebral conjunctiva. And this has actually come in handy many, many times where I took the, the image on the original dry eye eval, and then months later, these papillae are two, three times that size. They're a grade four instead of a grade two. And I, I love having this technology where I can go back and look at it and say, ah, this is the big difference. And then I do just a straight image of the cornea and conge, and then I'm going to do a video, and the video is going to serve me in many ways because it's going to let me assess their blink later on. So I tell them, I say, now I'm just getting set up. You blink as much as you want to, and you saw just a second ago she had two demarcation lines. So she's doing partial blinks, and we're going to slow that video down a little bit later and be able to see that. Then I have them hold it open where I can see that breakup have them blink a few more times so I've got another another glimpse at what their blink quality is. And this is also going to show me the, the quality of the tear film as well because you'll notice on this side she's going to have a lot more stuff floating in that tear film. Now by the time I got to the left eye, had a little bit less fluorescein in there and so what I did was just come down here and increase my gain, increase my exposure so that I could see my details better. So all of this stuff is adjustable. However, we've set it at what will work for most patients. So here's our straight on image, and then we go into our video, have her blink a few times, stay open. And then once we see that, that breakup happening, let her blink again. And at this point, our capture session is done. And it's taken about 10 minutes on average. That's it. So people ask me all the time, well, how long does it take? How long does it take? How long does it take? And I, I challenge them and I say, don't think about how much money am I going to make per minute during this dry eye eval. Think about, I always forget, we go on to the upper palpebral conch. Think about the results it's going to give you because of this patient education session, because of what the patient's going to get to see, because it's going to create, um, it's going to create compliance and it's going to create adherence to your treatment recommendations, and that's what's key in this. So you might think, well, do we really need this image? Um, the reality is, once you flip it and then it takes the image, it goes right into mybography. And we definitely wanted to get to get the upper lid on mybography. So it was no extra trouble and no extra time to get the, the regular white light image for it. So I find it useful. I include it. And you'll notice when I'm doing my biography, I'm constantly kind of moving my thumb to change the angle. And that's going to decrease your glare. So work with your technician on that, on how to get the best mybography image and what to do if there's little glare, there's dark spots or there's shiny spots that keeps you from seeing those glands. It starts out blurry because I've pulled my, my bowl, my keratograph all the way back so that I've got room to flip those lids. And then come in, click it, it goes right to my biography. We're already pretty much in focus, just need to adjust the angle. And then do that lower lid, and then we're done. <laughs> now, and you've seen different inverters. This is a good one, but it really all depends on the lid structure. Sometimes it's difficult to do with your thumb, and the inverter makes all the difference in the world. Other times, your, your thumb is going to be your best instrument. So you just kind of have to, to play with it both ways. You see the glare was a lot. And if I let go a little bit, reduces the glare. At this point, um, I'm going to ask the technician to save and exit. Uh -oh. And 
she can then pull it up in my exam room if or in your exam room if the keratograph is not in your exam room and you're ready for that patient education piece. So again, that's the end of the capture. That was your full capture list. That's everything that it can assess about the tear film and for dry eyes. You don't have to include all those tests, but now you know what it can do. And at the end, I'm going to show you how to, to create your own customized work list and you can you can use just one representative of each category that you're trying to assess, like one for my bomian gland function, one for water, or you can do multiple, whichever you find the most value in. So at this point, I want to take you into the patient education part before I take you into the assessment. And the reason is the assessment takes a few minutes. It takes about seven minutes the way that I did it here. The patient education takes about three minutes. And I didn't want you to get bogged down in the assessment and not realize how quick the patient education part really is. So in my exam, in my room, I do the patient education first. My technician comes in later and does the assessment according to what I've told her in the exam room. So I don't even do it. That's really a doctor preference if you want to do it yourself or if you have somebody you can rely on and train. So what I love about this software is our ability to tell the story to the patient. So I can show them both eyes or I can show them one eye at a time. And if you look at this, I'm able to tell them that story that I promised them. I told them when they walked in, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find out, is there enough water, oil, allergy, inflammation, bacteria, lid function, something systemic, something environmental. And so let's look and see what we've got. And I go through and say, all right, we've got, we've got enough water. Let's look, see the oil glands, how they're a little bit backed up. Not bad though, but look, you're not getting a lot of color in your tear film. So the oil's not getting in there. That's causing your tears to break up a little more quickly. That's affecting your vision, making you have to blink more. And then over time, it can cause changes to these glands, and it can cause you to lose glands. And you see, this is what normal looks like, and you don't have as many as they do. They're not as long. They're more engorged, and you're starting to lose some on these extreme edges, it's starting to shorten. What you do have in your tear film is a lot of debris from multiple causes. Now, over time, that's going to cause inflammation. You're going to have redness, thick pink lids. You don't have that yet, but it can happen. And we want to act now before we get there. And this is the picture of the lysamine dye. Now, Sarah didn't have any, but when there is uh, staining there, then you can tell them, you know, this, this kind of environment is causing inflammatory issues structurally now. It's not just about the tears, it's causing damage to that ocular surface. So I can tell them that entire story and then move right on to the next dye. Go through the whole story again. Now, a lot of times I might start with this overview, overview but then I go to the, each individual picture so, they, so that it's big enough for them to see it. Patients are very taken back by a few things. They hate to see that debris in the tear film and they hate to see that they don't blink all the way. So I use this video and I slow it down. I can play it at half or quarter speed or I can just drag the bar and make it stop where I want to show them those partial blinks and show them those demarcation lines and then explain to them why it's important. This has saved me a ton of time because before I was showing them a laminated piece of paper that showed normal glands and I felt like I was trying to sell something that I was trying to talk them into believing this and now with this I can simply drag the bar and it's clear they understand um, the consequence they understand their status and so it makes them understand why I'm recommending a treatment for them And that's it. So that's my patient education piece. Sometimes if there's a big difference, like with Sarah, um, there's more debris in her tear film on this left eye. I can pull up both eyes and show her the difference if there was a lot more oil in one eye versus the other. And lots of dry eye patients will have some asymmetry there. So you've seen the capture sequence on the full report and you've seen the patient education piece and now I want to walk you through the assessment process. So again this could be in front of the patient or it can be done after the patient leaves. For me my technician does this and she 
makes the report and prints it out for them. So let me stop real quick here. We got there, so she had already exited out of the report and we can get there by going to examination load and you see all the images are here individually but at the very bottom of those that we captured at this session there's the dry eye report so you go down click on that and it's going to pull it back up right where we left off I can assess categories at a time. Now there's a couple that I need to do something on. So tear meniscus height, I like to know a number. So I go over there and get my little tool and I measure my tear meniscus height. So I'll come out, I'll go ahead and get that done in both eyes. And there's a lot of different ways that you can view this. There's no wrong way. When we get back to the other screen, I'll tell you a couple tips. So see, I can click on aqueous deficiency and see all the pictures that are in that category, or I can click on them individually. If this button right here that says both eyes is clicked, you're going to see right eye, left eye. If that's unclicked, you're going to see it for just one eye. Now, once I've assessed it, I come down here and I have saved my normal, my mild, my moderate, my severe. And I can just click on that tab and it's going to fill in the treatments that I usually recommend for that category. Now, I can still unclick them or click on additional ones. Then I go into my, uh, my bone and gland disease, the next category. I go ahead and do my drag bar and grade my myography for each eye. And any time you're on an individual line again, just go back up to that category title and it'll pull everything back up. But once you go into grade one, it's going to keep you on that individual item as opposed to being on the whole category again. But it's very, very simple to go back and forth. So I click on my category. I'm going to grade everything in there, both eyes at once to make it quick. So lid appearance, pretty normal, tear breakup time, a little bit uh, short line of marks, pretty normal. My bony and gland function, she was a little stagnant. You didn't see that, but I did it at the slit lamp. Nick butt, we glance at it, and up here you see the, the timetable of which spots she dried out on and then down here you're going to see the average breakup time and the first breakup. So you see she broke up much quicker on her left eye than her right eye. That's the eye that had the more tear film debris as well. So I can do individual results by clicking this button and then going over here and clicking there. And then I'm when I want to grade both at once I click up here in this box individual click down here or you can unclick the both eyes and do just one eye at a time you do not have to grade all these you can right click any of these line items and it will hide it for you it doesn't even show up on the report you can also right click the entire category and hide it so then I move on to inflammation now you noticed I didn't put any treatments down there just to show you that you can go through and assess the whole thing and come back and do the treatments or you'll see in a second I'm gonna grade my inflammation do the treatments and then jump back up and do the, the MGD treatments just to show you that it's um, completely flexible there's no there's no um, no rules that you have to adhere to on this And you can see, especially with inflammation, you get a lot of information all at once. Now, in her case, there's not as much to see because there's not as much uh, conjunctival staining. But there are plenty of patients where you pu I pull them up and just immediately you have a, an overall impression of there is a lot of inflammation there or there's not much. Um, and just being able to see all that at once really helps solidify it in your mind of what it, where am I at in this category? Is it positive or minus? And how, how aggressive do my treatments need to be? 
And that's pretty key because if you treat one category and you're very successful and treat it well, but you leave other ones unmanned, the patient's not going to feel what they want to feel. They're not, they're going to think we failed because they didn't get their ultimate relief and outcome. Even though we were successful, we just didn't address all the categories at once. So it's really important to do that. And I definitely attribute my successful outcomes to doing that, to treating everything at once and then tapering off the treatments as we, as we establish stability. So same pattern all the way through. We're allergy now, jump to lid function. So I want to see, all right, did she have partial blinks or not? I'm going to click on that video. I can open the exam and really control that slide bar and watch this video. And you can see it pretty easily. She just had one partial blink with the demarcation line. When she has a full blink, when any patient has a full blink, the screen goes black. So it's great to do this test with the fluorescein in because it's so easy to see when they do their partial blinks and easy to show them. And I tell them, remind them why it's so critical. Not only when you partial blink do you have evaporation and exposure, you're not closing those lids together. Therefore, the sphincters around these oil glands are staying closed. So you're not getting that oil into the tear film because the lids aren't ever touching. So in addition to lacking oil, you've got exposure and evaporation, um, which then causes secondary inflammation and damage to the glands. And then you're also inhibiting that drainage process, that little siphoning effect that, that uh, clears the tears. Exposure staining, no. Chalases, a little bit. And then we get to uh, the next categories, contact lens and dry eye, and she's not wearing them, so I right click and hide the entire category, and we won't see it again. Drag back down, and we look at some external influencers, and don't underestimate how significant those external factors can influence um, your patient's success, especially computer time and glaucoma drops. Now you'll see up here, these categories are set for you according to the dry eye protocol, but down here, I'm gonna show you how to customize these. You can make however many you want. So environmental influence, medication side effects, and then systemic side effects. And I'm probably slower at this assessment than she is because I don't do it very often. So assessment's done. And at this point, we can print out the report. Now, I'm going to show you the print to PDF. And that's very nice because you might want to put it in the patient's portal for them to access it there instead of printing it out, email it to them, or you might want to print it out, but you've got that option. Now, you also have the option of doing the full report or doing just the treatment recommendation page. And one big difference between the two is that the treatment recommendation consolidates all the recommendations. So here we've got, let's stop this. This is showing us what are her major problems. We've got two categories where at least one test within that category showed up as severe. And we've got a few that are moderate, mild, and normal. So it's going to go in that order. If oil and external are her two red severe categories, oil is going to be first. And you're going to see, well, yeah, it's red, it's severe, but look, only one test. The rest of them were mild and normal. And then it's going to go to that external, that next red category, and it continues down according to the, the lessening severity. When we get through each one of these, and the other thing to notice is it has the treatments that are specific to that category. And so these are going to overlap because your, your PRN, your omega, might be good for inflammation, but also good for aqueous, also good for meibomian gland. So that's the difference between the treatment list here versus the treatment summary, which only has each treatment listed once. But I think it's important for them to see that uh, what treatment does what. Then there's a glossary of all the tests, 
and what it's showing us. And then finally, that summary of recommendations and just a little pep talk or kind of accountability statement telling them that their treatment's only going to work as much as they do. And that's it. That's the end of the, the whole assessment process. So our capture was about 10 minutes. This assessment process where I kind of took the time to show you and print out the report was about seven minutes of assessment and two minutes to print the report. And then the last thing is going to be um, the customization. And this is so easy. I, it would be just kind of silly not to make it your own and make it do exactly what you want it to do. So you are going to come up here to settings and go down to, all right, let me go back. Settings and then Dry Eye Report Customization Editor. So you're going to use that one and you're also going to use this next one that says Recommendation Preset Editor. Those are the two, the two key items. So this page is going to come up and what you see is on the left are the assessment items, like what you're grading. On the right are the capture items and you notice that when something turns blue on this side, something else is turning blue over here. And the reason is to say, okay, well you could delete this, but it's helping you assess two or three categories. So it's just helping connect those for you so that if you want to delete it completely, you delete everything involved with it or you don't accidentally delete something that's being used to assess a different category. So you'll see that I clicked on a couple things and marked them out. If I want to undo that, I just click on it again and it's blue again. I named it something new and then I'm going to click create report. This is very important. When it first pulled up, you saw that it was named full because that's the list we started with. If you just click save, you're going to override the full and your full is going to look different than that original one. So be careful not to do that. But this enables you to make, make unlimited amount of work lists. So if you have multiple doctors in the office, you can have them according to the doctor or you can have them according to the type of patient, you know, the patient's doing well, a quick follow up, or we want something that's more uh, detailed because they're not getting the outcome that they should be at this point. Now the other thing that you're going to want to customize is that recommendation preset. So the reason that, um, let me show you this again. Once we saved that report, so we saved it as the CB's full report, at any point when you're in the capture screen, you can go to Sorry, there we go. You can go to convert current report to and it's going to be in that list. And so let's say you start out doing a screening, but you want to convert it to a full. You stop right where you're at, come up here and convert it to any of the others that you have saved. All right, so on to the treatments. Now it's going to pull up like this. You're going to have every category that you're able to assess listed here and you're going to choose what do you want it to come up when it's when you click on my normal my mild my moderate my severe you can rename these you can add more categories if you want to you can have dr brown's <laughs> recommendation dr smith's recommendation however you want to specify this and as many as you want and then you go straight to the next category make it your own now the dry eye protocol, the vision source dry eye protocol recommendations are in there, but ultimately because of liability reasons, you have to, to choose them and save them as your own. So here I'm showing you an example of adding a new preset. So I put in there, you know, let's put in there 12 hours and click OK and all of a sudden you've got another column and you can put in whatever treatment you want. Now you can also add a recommendation. So you can come down here and add something else. If you don't like the brand or you want to, you got a, a homemade remedy you want to add in there, help yourself. So just to kind of reiterate here, the main buttons you're going to use up top 
are print and you've got the option print to paper and this is the whatever report you're on so if you're on a screening report it would be print the screening report or print just the summary onto paper and then you can print to PDF the full report or print the summary to PDF next thing you're going to use up here is your settings to customize your work list and customize your treatments and then this you're going to go back and forth on quite a bit so you might be in capture mode and jump over to assessment you're in assessment mode and you're thinking oh i need more pictures on this and you just jump back over to capture and at that point if you want to convert to a different report you can absolutely do so So what I'm doing right now is just changing it to capture so I could show you that. So I'm going to continue capture. It thinks I'm done, but I'm not done. If I want to do more pictures here, click on the title. If I want to show the picture, click on the picture. And also if you wanted to delete, so here we are changing it to another report. If you wanted to delete something in that column, you can right click and delete. So we've tried to make it just as, as friend, user friendly as humanly possible to save time and to make it simple um, so that you can really incorporate this into your practice and be able to, to raise your level of care for dry eye patients and get more consistent outcomes and do it without causing detriment to the flow or to uh, morale or the staff and just uh, fit it in just make it easy to incorporate so that's everything I wanted to show you we've definitely got a few minutes so we're open for questions and Chris is going to kind of facilitate that for us yeah thank you Dr. Brummer uh, very good presentation we appreciate that so um, we do have some questions here and if you joined us a little late I'll just remind everybody if you have a question to ask Dr. Brummer uh, please put that in the uh, questions text box that you should see on the right side of your screen in that go to webinar control panel uh, and then I will go ahead and uh, pass those questions on to Dr. Brimer. So the first question here is a clinical question. Uh, during the Nick butt test after the patient blinks twice do you ask them to hold their eye wide open or just have normal posture? I do not ask them to hold it wide open. I just say, okay, I want you to blink twice. Now hold it open as long as you can. Okay, thank you. And then uh, another question here. Um, how do you change the recommendations? For example, it says Oasis Tears. How do we change it to a different brand? So in that top bar, that menu that we were at, Let's see. Oh, you did you take control back over? No, here we go. So right up here, you're going to go to settings. And then, let's see. All right. You're going to come down to recommendation preset editor and what you're going to do, let's, let me find the spot where we were at. All right. So let's say that this said Oasis and you wanted to get rid of it. Just don't click it and that one will never show up. And then down here you can say add recommendation and you can put in whatever brand or whatever treatment that you want and click it and it will show up. So it's not that you're going to be able to edit one that's already in the default, but if you don't click it, you're never going to see it again. Uh, and I think there's a, a couple questions that are somewhat related, so I'll try and maybe consolidate these into into one question. Um, do you do a screen test on all of your patients, and which test do you do for a screening? And there's another question here um, that says, what is your typical follow-up frequency, and are you doing all of these tests on every visit? So maybe uh, do you have a different protocol for screening? Do you have a different protocol for follow-up visits and that kind of thing. Okay, so on that, uh, let's see if I can show it to you here. On, all right, you see right here, these are the default ones, full, abbreviated, follow-up, and screening. On the screening, it is um, tear meniscus height, 
nick butt, and redness. And we do these on everybody, and the screening report looks different than the full report. It's made for everybody to get it, and we hand them a piece of paper that educates them and puts this bug in their ear that you may or may not have symptoms now. There's a lot of different symptoms linked to this. You you may or may not have signs. Here's your here's your assessment. If you do, then symptoms may follow, and it may be important that we intervene now instead of later. So the screening report is truly a screening report, and it is a, a tool to grow the practice as well. So I encourage you to use that screening, um, those tests, and that report. It's very quick. It takes about just a minute and a half to get that for the patient and then have it printed out by the technician before you ever walk in the door. Now, you can change those three tests. You can put whatever you want on there by coming to the screen and marking through or adding. On my follow-up, I want to test every category and I don't want a bunch of tests for each one, just one, but I want to use the same test each time. So my follow-up consists of tear meniscus height for water, interferometry for oil because it's quicker than the neck butt, and then I do tear film dynamic and redness just to kind of look do I have a lot of outstanding inflammation how are we doing what's the tear film look like and those four things really they give me a lot of information um, at this point the patient expects it they expect me to show it to them and I do it on every follow-up visit and I bill for anterior segment photos for it um, I have the oculus in my exam room so it makes it really easy for me to do that as far as uh, what was the other question Chris um, so the the questions were, you know, what are your te your screening, screening protocols up. versus uh, follow up protocols versus the maybe the uh, full dry workup that you kind of went over yeah. during the presentation. I thought there was another question, but the abbreviated one is between a follow up and the full. And basically, what you saw me do included topography. It included um, lysamine green, looking nasal, looking temporal. It included tear film dynamic picture and video, interferometry picture and video. On the abbreviated ones, there's no redundancy. There's no picture. It's just the video. Lysamine green, it's just a straight on view, no nasal and temporal. So it just, it's all the elements still, but it's just a snapshot. And so you can get through it quicker but I wanted to go through the full one with you so you really saw everything that you could do. Okay, um, I had, and you kind of already uh, maybe mentioned uh, this a little bit, um, but maybe you could talk a little bit more about um, reimbursement. Now, feel free to be as specific as you want to be, and, and, that, and that's fine if you want to. I could never um, get in trouble general. that way, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, um, you know, just uh, gen some general questions here. How do you charge for Oculus testing? Um, one that's a little more specific question here on your full report, how do you normally code that visit? Do you use both a 99XXX uh, visit code and then a 0330T code, which is the um, I believe the category three CPT code. Okay, so, and I I remembered that other question too. It was the frequency of follow ups. So I'll kind of incorporate that into this one. Now, I am not a billing expert, um, and but I'll tell you what I do. Also, we're not setting fees, and I have no intention of doing so. So if I tell you what I charge, it, it's not any influence on what you charge. That's my disclaimer. That will surely get me out of jail. Um, when they come in for their first visit and their dry eval, most of the time they've been referred from somewhere else, so they're a new patient to me. I'm going to do a 9-9 code, and depending on how long they're there, how elaborate it is, it's probably going to be a 9-9-204. Um, now, you know that there's requirements on the medical decision making and such that that allow you to choose that level but also time plays in so keep that in mind on your follow-ups and on your your initial visits if you've met the time requirement that also counts so when i walk into the exam room my technician writes down it's it's time stamped she we know exactly what time i walked in what time i walked out and what portion was spent on counseling so with this initial visit, I'm going to bill an office visit. I'm going to bill an out-of-pocket fee that is not turned into insurance. And in my office, we charge $99 for that. 
you need to have the equipment if you're going to do that. Um, and with the 5M, I can do, you know, exponentially more than I would do in a regular exam. So I feel like that's very warranted. I'm also going to do osmolarity, love osmolarity, and I'm going to do um, topography if there is a dystrophy and it's warranted. Um, and the anterior segment photos. I'm still going to build those as well. So we've got office visit, photos, Osmo, and potentially Topo, and a $99 out-of-pocket fee for the first visit. As far as when I ask them to follow up, a lot of things that I'll recommend take about two months to kick in. So I tell them I'm not going to have you back before then because if we are not where we need to be, I don't want to change anything. I haven't given it time. So most of the time my first follow ups at two months. However, if I've shown them this and we're talking about lipoflow, I don't want them to wait two months to do it. So I'm going to bring them back sooner for that. And then I'm going to see them back at two weeks and two months after lipoflow. Now, after this initial follow up visit, I keep stretching it out, depending on how solid they are, how well they're doing. A lot of times I'll go about three months the next time. And then after that one, I'll go six months. So that first year, I'm probably seeing them four times total. I'd like to do an annual dry eye eval. Um, don't charge them quite as much and it doesn't take as long. Um, but I, I, I like my follow-ups because it's, it's putting this puzzle together. When they walk in, whether they're doing great, that's exciting and we celebrate. If they're not, it's just another little mystery that we solve. And it's not frustrating anymore. It's not aggravating the way that it has been to me in the past because I look at them and I say, all right, well, we're going to do just what we did on the first visit. I'm going to look and see what's working and what we've, we've, we've improved on and what we've not improved on. We're going to increase those treatments and some of the other ones we might be able to taper off. And every time I see them in my mind behind that slit lamp, I'm doing the same thing over again. Water, oil, allergy, inflammation, bacteria, lid function, systemic. But the difference is I get them to do what I need them to do because I also show it to them on the 5M. Thanks. And uh, another another question that I think that maybe uh, is we're getting questions that are tacked on to uh, questions responses. Um, so what what do you call the ninety nine dollar out of pocket fee and and what what does that cover? What are you uh, saying that covers? Well, not that I say it covers anything, but um, the the ninety nine dollar fee is basically for all this time with the five M, um, and for just the extensive counseling, patient education, creating that plan together, because it's much more elaborate than what I would do in a regular office visit. Now, the reason I say you, you need to have equipment to be able to justify that is you need to be able to, to justify it with that equipment, and this is not just a photo. We're doing other tests here besides just a photo but it's basically representing the 5M time. Okay. Um, and again, I'm gonna have to maybe consolidate uh, some of these questions just uh, in the interest of time, um, but I'll, I'll uh, can you talk a little bit about some of your go-to treatments? And we got some specific questions on, do you use Blefex, do you use Inflamadry? Um, and asking about uh, meibomian gland expression and lid debridement and that kind of thing. Can you just talk about uh, your treatments a little bit, maybe to summarize for those questions? That's like opening them. <laughs> opening yeah, a can I, of worms. I know. <laughs> um, my go-to treatments, I, and I, I do tell this to people a lot, I don't apologize. The 5M is the cornerstone of my practice because there is no way you're going to get anybody to do anything if you don't take the time to show them. And if I didn't take the time to break down the diagnosis, my go-to diagnostically is this. I like osmolarity with it. That's probably my other um, big favorite. My go-to on treatments is Lipiflow. It, it absolutely is. And, you know, there's there, there's various degrees of meibomian gland dysfunction, but it is rare that by the time they get to me, they don't have it, that they couldn't be benefited by Lipiflow. And I will say that I'm very specific in how I do it and how I um, – how I coach them on it and, and bring it up to them. I'm not selling them on anything. I send them home with a picture of their meibomian glands and a brochure that shows them what normal and abnormal is. And I tell them we can try some other things first, but ultimately this is going to be what, what draws that line in the sand. And that's what it is. But we're going to evacuate those glands. We need to change the environment that got you here. 
or you're going to get clogged up again. And that means being on this medical grade omega-3, doing your blink exercises, doing your warm compresses. And I love Tranquilize because it's going to stay hot longer. And I love PRN. I've found tremendous success with that. So those are probably my little go-to pocket of treatments there. And I everybody goes home with a lid scrub. Why not? Brush your teeth. <laughs> so I, I there's multiple good ones there. Um, and I when I have persistent staining or I have filaments, I'm going to do Procara, and I do autologous blood serum. Sometimes both if they're if they're in really bad shape. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think that uh, I have a good question to to close the evening on. Um, you mentioned your practice is now 90% ocular surface disease, but it didn't start out that way. Can you tell us how that occurred? And uh, one other follow-up question on that, uh, are most of your referring doctors other optometrists or primary care or both? Okay. Um, we are in a fairly small town, just a little over 100,000, and but we're at the beach, and so we've got a lot of ODs, a lot, super saturated, and very territorial. We don't like to refer to each other because you might sell them a pair of glasses. So there's been other people try in my town doing vision therapy and things, but we've never been very good at it, at sharing, and be, I have been amazed at how many have referred to me. Out of the 29, 16 were ophthalmologists. The rest were optometrists except for one primary care and one PA um, and I have not even entered or asked for primary care referrals yet but I think that's a very big avenue I think even um, medical spas because this is a lot of women who are not not afraid to, to spend money to, to fix something and to, to make themselves feel better but the referrals started by just the outcomes you spend the time diagnosing. Do not skimp on this eval. It's the most important thing you'll do with that patient for the rest of your relationship together. Diagnose. Do the patient education. Don't skip it. Don't skimp on it. Do everything you need. It's going to create the compliance, which is going to create the outcomes. That's going to create the referrals and the growth of the practice. So I got referrals first just by doing what I'm doing and kind of getting the word out there. Hey, I want, I'm specializing in dry eye and buying the equipment that I needed. That's key too, because why would they refer to you if you don't have something they don't? And it gives them an out. They can say, well, she's just got the equipment for it and I don't. Otherwise, there's a little bit of discomfort there. And why would you refer to a, to a colleague with the same degree and training if, why, why can't you do it? So the equipment is key. Um, so I put the word out there, started getting the referrals. Then I got the idea of I'm going to video everything I do. So I did. I videoed Lipiflow and Blefex and Procara and um, the 5M workup, all this stuff. And we made a little slide deck and my staff went around to the a, a few referring uh, ophthalmologists or we refer to them and they're in the community. And we just wanted to meet with their staff, not even the doctor because the staff are the ones that get the questions. A week after that, uh, I did an open house and I had, I don't know, probably 15 doctors come and I did a live Lipiflow, a live Blifex, a 5M workup. I had all the products there that I sell, some wine and beer, <laughs> and just showed them what I do. And ever since then, you know, I made up a little packet, sent it out all the offices, but that was a year ago. That was last September. Might have been the September before. Um, I think it was last September and I haven't done anything since so it's really it's one thing to get your foot in the door but you better have the outcomes to back it up because when they send you a patient that one patient represents a lot of future patients or an absence of future patients from that same doctor so we really put a lot of weight on that and we we treat them carefully and I put it in my EMR you don't sell them glasses we don't book a routine appointment here they're not our patient Okay. Well, um, I think we'll, uh, we'll call that a night. Uh, again, thank you very much, Dr. Brammer, for your excellent presentation. And on behalf of Oculus, uh, thank you. And everybody out there, uh, thanks for uh, joining us. If you missed part of the webinar, 
Uh, you will get an email tomorrow with the recording. Um, if you have any questions about the Keratograph 5M or any other Oculus products, you can contact us at the 1-800 num number listed on the screen or via email at sales at oculususa.com. Uh, we also do post these uh, webinars to our website, typically about two weeks after the live webinar. Um, and you can view other lectures from the past on this website at www.oculususa.com. And those prior webcasts are in the webcast section. And we also have a Oculus TV website where you can uh, view uh, lectures from the podium as well, and that's www.oculustv.com. So again, thank you again, Dr. Brimer. Uh, we appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris, and thank you for everybody to spend your Wednesday night with us. Good luck. Thank you. Have a good night. You too.